Through the transformation of a dilapidated old sheep farm into a beautiful mystical sanctuary comes the awakening of finding grace in everything. Finding grace in everything is being willing to accept what is, no longer struggling with reality, but instead flowing with the river of life with all its twists and turns, open and present to all that arises. Everything comes for us to use as a gift. Saying yes takes us on the extraordinary adventure from the known into the unknown. Join me on this adventure. About 18 years ago was when I first had this vision of a sanctuary, a beautiful 38 acre or 40 acre sanctuary where there were beautiful meadows and trees and, and swings and it was to be a place for the magical child within each one of us to be to feel safe, to be creative. So this vision kind of followed me around and I didn't know why it was following me around because I didn't have any money to do this or the real wherewithal but for some reason I'd wake up in the morning or throughout the day there'd be little flashes of this place. So anyway, I, I kind of ignored it. And, and I did start to realize after many, many years that you don't have a vision. A vision has you. And it has you totally and completely. And this really has been the journey and the story of Xenia, the story of being had by a vision. And then learning that you may think you have a vision, but in fact, you have a business. <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to share with you some of the journey of this beautiful place called Xenia and how it came into being and some of the stories along the way. So in 1994, I was in a position to buy this 40 acres if I went to Timbuktu or if I went to Fort St. somewhere way up in, in the northern part of British Columbia. But because I was already living on Bowen Island, I wanted it to be on Bowen Island. So for the amount of money, I thought, well, I'm only going to be able to get two acres on Bowen Island. So I had a real estate agent, Gail Taylor, take me around to various places and she would take me to some very lovely places but something in my heart something just couldn't be reconciled by the vision which had meadows and trees and space so as she took me to these places I was a bit disheartened and I let it go and um, one day she phoned me and said Angeline I have to take you to a place it's not on the market yet but I have to take you don't ask any questions I said, oh, okay. So I was quite, it was quite a mystery. So I met her that next day and we came down. And as we started driving down the road, my cells were just tingling all over. I was like, oh my God, this feels very right, very familiar. And I said to her, how many acres is this? This looks big. She says it's 38 acres. I said, 38 acres? Oh my God, how much does that cost? And she told me how much, and it was sure enough three, four times the amount that I had to, to, to do this. So I said, why are you bringing me here? And she said, oh, I'm sorry. This I know it's very unprofessional. She said, but something told me I had to phone you and bring you here. So I said, okay. So we had a look around, and it was a broken down, dilapidated old sheep farm. It was every single building, as you can see in some of the images here, were just totally, it was just torn down and sad and... But, you know, when you are given a vision or when a vision has you, you have the ability to actually see that vision superimposed over top of the other, the, you know, the reality. So I could see and I was like, oh, my God, this is the place. And I knew in my heart and in my soul, this was the place. Then it took about a year of going to various people because now I needed to find more money to be able to pull this off. 
So I went to lots of doctors and investors, people that I thought might be interested in a retreat center like this. So I bring them here and they'd look around and they didn't see what I saw at all. They just saw what was actually here. So they said, hmm, there, there were lots of problems or they wanted to, you know, take everything down and develop. And so in the end, it was it was very disheartening. I, I kept going to lots of different banks and all that I'd say to the banks, you know, well, I have this vision. And they said, OK, where's the business plan? Give us the bottom line. And I said, oh, I don't know the bottom line, but I know this is meant to be. So they would kind of laugh me out of the bank and send me on my way. And eventually I really couldn't find any help. So I ended up letting it go as a crazy idea. Because after all, if I did buy this land, what did I know about renovation? What did I know about business? What did I know about a retreat center? Nothing. What did I know about, you know, stewarding thousands of trees? Nothing. So I did agree that perhaps it was a crazy idea and and I let it go. It was It was kind of very sad and I noticed over the next month or so I kept being pulled back here. I kept kind of finding my way back here and going and sitting on the land. It just, it was very hard. But anyway, eventually I did let go. So one day I was in the city at a workshop or it was a big conference with Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer. And I was there in the front seat. I was there very early in the morning. I like to be able to just see them really close. So there I was in the front. And Deepak said something that just really stayed with me. That one, I think I went just for that one piece. And the next morning, I was back on Bowen Island. And I was on the, there's a boardwalk, the lake that goes around Kalani Lake. I was sitting on the boardwalk on the bench. And I, as I was sitting there, I, 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 what I wanted to say was, it's been two years since my husband had died and I had to deal with a lot of things. And it was now time to go back to work. What should I do? Should I go back into the corporate world or what kind of a job should I get? But what came out of my mouth was, how may I be of service? And as I said that out loud, I kind of heard myself say that. And I thought that was an unusual thing to say. But right away I heard, buy the land behind you and begin the sanctuary. And at that point I was furious. I was so mad, I just, I stomped off the boardwalk and I, and as I stepped off the, because I was saying, well, Okay, you want me to do this, but where is the help? I've been trying for a year, so I was really mad. As I stepped off the boardwalk, something inside of me knew it was going to happen. And 12 weeks later, I had this place in my name, signed, sealed, and delivered. So that was how the beginning happened. And it was a, a blessed day of ceremony when we signed on the dotted line and became stewards of this beautiful place. So what Deepak said was that each one of us has a unique gift. And if we can find out what that gift is and express it, we'll be fulfilled. So it was absolutely a miracle and we had a beautiful celebration. I think we had three bottles of champagne being popped all at the same time. It was such an incredible miracle to be able to say that we could be here on this land to, to build the sanctuary. And uh, so we had a lovely, we did some drumming and honored. We, we stood around, there's 21 of us standing around Opa, that, which is the big tree, the thousand year old tree. And we were drumming and giving thanks and gratitude. Now what happened after that was, 
over the next number of weeks, it was still bliss. It was the honeymoon and everything was wonderful and lots of time to just sit in the land and contemplate and think. Then my dad, my dad was over from England probably a month or two later and he was looking around and he says, I remember, I'll never forget it, he had his head in his hands like this and he said, Angeline, oh my God, what have you done? And as he said that, suddenly I went, oh my God, what have I done? And it was as if the whole vision, the image of the vision disappeared and suddenly all I could see was the debris. <laughs> all I could see was the mess and oh my God, what have I done? With that, I kind of plummeted into about a month or so of deep doubt and fear and worry. Like, what have I done? Oh my God, what have I done? And I started to become very afraid and I started to feel separate from everyone and everything. And, and in, in my haste to figure out what to do next, I, I um, arranged for a group of experts to come to my house and tell me what to do. So I invited all these different people from the island and off island, lovely people, people with their own businesses, people with the wherewithal to know how to build and how to develop and how to do business plans and marketing. And, and I was, it was an amazing meeting. But the more that they told me what to do that evening, the deeper I fell into overwhelm the more overwhelmed I became throughout the evening. Started to think, oh my God, I have to do all the renovations, I have to do all the gardening, I have to make beds, I have to do, I have to do the marketing, the teaching the programs, leading it. Oh, suddenly I was like, oh my God, oh my God, what have I done, what have I done? It was a horrible place. I went to bed that night, sick to my stomach, totally sick to my stomach. And I thought, oh, I've made a big, huge mistake and, and how am I gonna get out of this gracefully? Because after all, I told the community, oh, I'm, I'm going to build a retreat center. And I felt very humbled and very afraid and overwhelmed. And when I woke up in the morning, thinking it would have all gone away in the night, I woke up feeling worse, just this knot in my stomach. And I thought, okay, how am I going to sell this land? And it was already a complicated bit of land I bought. There were all kinds of strata titles and things. It was a very complex thing to, to buy in the first place. Would have taken a crazy person to really buy it. <laughs> but um, so 10 to 11 that morning, Sunday morning, I think Crystal, Crystal was in the kitchen with me. And 10 to 11, the phone rang. And it was Carol Fernie. Now, Carol Fernie was the lady that sold me the land, not directly through the real estate agent, but she, her husband and my husband died the same year. And her husband also had a dream about a community with this land. So, but we hadn't really, we didn't really have a, um, a friendship or anything. So it was a very unusual thing for her to phone me. So I'm like, Carol Fernie, why is she phoning? Anyway, she says, well, hello, Angeline. She says, it's Carol Fernie. Um, I'm phoning to see how your project's coming along. I said, oh, well, um, I'm not a very good liar. I said, well, Carol, I love the land. I love the land. I'm, it's dear to my heart. I said, but you know what? I think I've gone in over my head. I think I've made a big mistake. So she said, well, may I ask a personal question? Can I ask a personal question? I said, of course, sure. What's the question? She says, do you believe in a higher intelligence? And I was, all of a sudden, I was like, oh my God, I forgot. And it was as if this big weight fell away. I says, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I do actually. I do believe in a higher intelligence. So she said, then all you have to do is get clear and everything will be provided. So I put the phone down and it took me a moment just to register what had happened. This guardian angel phoned out of the blue just at that most important moment. And it just brought the awareness once again that I'm not alone, 
I'm not doing this. I mean, I was confused. I thought I had to do all of this. And I suddenly remembered that this isn't about me. This is about a lot of people. It's about God. It's about, it's, it's definitely not just about me. So that was a really big relief. And I thank God for that phone call that day. Gave me the courage to go on. It has been amazing how many people have shown up for us here. It's like I know that when we first started Xenia, that is one thing that we had no idea would happen. No idea. We thought we'd have to do it all alone. Mm -hmm. No idea. No, there's it's been hundreds and hundreds of people that have mm -hmm. supported the project from the very beginning, from the boardwalk around Opa. Mm -hmm. That was seven, seven people came together yeah. and we put in that beautiful boardwalk and then there was the, the, the woodshed. The woodshed, That was yes, another couple yes, of weekends. that was another, yeah. The sauna and the... The teepee. And of course the sanctuary here. Yeah, that's been, that. this has been a beautiful project where Tyler and Matthew have been coming every, they came every weekend mm -hmm. to uh, build this beautiful sanctuary behind us. So, you know, that, as you say, that was one of the things that we never really knew would happen. No. But my, I remember talking to my dad in England, I'd phone him and I said, Dad, he, he says, I told him about the volunteers that come, people that come and help. And he said, he said, um, <clears throat> let me get this straight. You're telling me that people come and they work and they sweat and they work really hard all day long mm -hmm. and maybe stay another day or even a few more days. And, and then they go home and then they phone you and thank you. Yes. I said, yeah, dad, that's what happens. He's like, no. I said, yes, Dad, it happens all the time here. Every weekend, every day, there's somebody helping us here. So it was, it was, I said, Dad, people really love being of service, and that's what this place provides. through that whole three year period there was a feeling like yes I know it's a sanctuary yes I, I we know we know that but there was a theme there was a sense of there's something we're supposed to know mm -hmm. and I even went and did a four day vision quest up at Angel's Landing um, thinking that I could tune in and find out what exactly I need to know what is the theme there's a theme there's a reason for this place. And all I got was plumb in another toilet. You know, <laughs> remember that? Yeah. It's like, well, that's not really very profound. I, I, I wanted to know something more about the theme. And it's like, nope, just plumb in another toilet. So the old sawmill site used to be this place full of garbage, big, huge mound of sawdust, remember? Yeah. And bikes, motorbikes, fridges, stoves, sinks. What else was on there? On and on. It just went. Well, lots of slash. Slash. The yeah. leftovers from the sawmill were all up there. Yeah. It was hard to even tell it was a meadow. It was just a big junk pile. I think it was for the island, island mm -hmm. metals and things, something. Anyway, I was sitting up there minding my own business on a beautiful sunny day. And I wasn't, I wasn't begging for a vision or asking for anything profound I was just sitting contemplating and I had my two dogs just sitting there and suddenly it was as if I was being downloaded and I got told build a labyrinth build it here build it now build a chapel and introduce the work of silence mm -hmm. and it was like end of transmission just boom and I wrote it down I remember running down to you, didn't I? I said, oh my God, I got this message. And my first question was, well, what's a labyrinth? And I kind of had a bit of an idea coming mm -hmm. from England. I knew about mazes and labyrinths, but I didn't really understand the tool of the labyrinth. So I ended up going down to 
Grace Cathedral in California to meet Lauren Artress and learn about the significance of this magnificent tool. And then there once again, look at what happened. In order to prepare for the labyrinth, as soon as we said yes, miracles. Oh, it was totally miracles. Remember? Oh. It was like this wonderful man showed up with his backhoe and he totally cleared all the debris. But before that, of course, we brought a green bin in. We recycled and the metals. And we filled the green bin with all the metal. the metal stuff. But this man who came in, he totally uncovered the beauty mm -hmm. of that meadow. Yeah. And then we have one of our neighbors. He brought in a whole, many, many truckloads of sawdust as the base. Mm -hmm. yeah for our yeah. Yeah. labyrinth. I've never seen energy move so fast as to get that whole area cleared. Because if we were, I would go up there for years wondering, oh my God, how, what are we gonna do here? How are we gonna clear it up? But yeah. within two weeks, the place was cleared and ready for the labyrinth to be created. Mm -hmm. and, that took, and that was when 50 volunteers showed up, 50 volunteers. Yeah. Over the space of four days, and the rocks somehow were not as heavy. I look at some of those rocks now and I wonder how we got them there. Yeah, it's amazing. And it was just people just carrying these rocks and going about all the land here mm -hmm. and just gathering rocks. Yeah. And four days complete. Yeah. So the labyrinth happened first. Yes. And then the sanctuary or the chapel mm -hmm. that we now call the sanctuary. Uh, that took a little longer, that took another year. This beautiful building, Tyler and Matthew, it took them a year to complete this. Mm -hmm. And then the silence took probably the longest. Yes. I think the silence to learn about stillness and silence took probably several years mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. we could host the silent retreats. And then that was the next great teaching. Learning to listen to the, the deep inner knowing has been quite a journey and the most profound lesson I guess I've ever had or direct experience of that happened um, way back about 18 years ago and what it involved was, was uprooting my whole life, uh, my daughter's life and um, really going against all logic, all sense. Many of my friends thought I was insane but yet there was something that that really drew me like a flame. It was, it was something compelling inside that I just had to follow, even though I did not want to with every bone in my body. But I noticed nevertheless, I was moving in this certain direction. As it turned out, about a year or so later, I realized that if I hadn't taken that action for those three months, then, the result would have been radically different and I would never have been able to purchase this land that we now call Xenia. So I really learned from that one experience how important it is to, to follow that deep inner knowing. And you know, often people say, well, well, I, I have that kind of a knowing, you know, I, I have, in fact, I have an invention, but really I'm not, I'm not, I can't really do it. And then there's a whole ream of reasons why not, a whole ream of excuses. But, you know, sometimes we just have to kind of jump off the cliff empty-handed and just trust that, indeed, this is the right action. And I'm a big advocate now of doing that. So any time that, that movement happening from inside, I follow it every time. Finding grace in everything has been quite an extraordinary adventure. And as I start to notice more and more that things don't come to me, they come for me. And that's a subtle but profound difference. And that's really the journey of this story, um, finding grace in everything. A pivotal moment happened uh, last summer. I was in Maui with my daughter 
and for three weeks we decided we were not going to speak of Xenia. We were going to take a real good holiday and rest. And on the very last day, I was walking along the beach with my girlfriend on our way before we were going to the airport. And I said to her, you know, if Xenia is going to make it, if this vision is really going to happen, it's going to take me showing up in the business. And as I said that, it was a very weird thing because it was as if I heard myself say that. And what she responded with was, that's the brightest thing I've ever heard you say about Xenia, Angeline. And with that thought came this feeling of, wow, that feels right. And almost a happiness started to um, arise in me. Now, this may seem strange, but for nine and a half years, I hadn't actually shown up in the business. I hadn't shown up in the office. I kept thinking, you know, this person knows, no, this person knows, looking for the white knights and the saviors and somebody else, the experts know what to do. Always kind of stepping aside slightly from taking any kind of real leadership in the vision. And, but it was in that moment, it was an extraordinary moment. And I know in that moment, everything changed. It was it was actually very simple and effortless and usually when such a radical change happens, usually for me in the past anyway, it's been with a two by four or some very difficult experience. But in this case, it was just literally hearing something that came out of my mouth. Now, I came back to Xenia and every day for probably the next three to six months, I showed up in the office, in the business. I really kind of stood in that position of, of presence and realized that I was the one I was looking for. So after all this time, I was the one I was looking for. It took a long time for that concept to really sink in, but immediately this whole shift happened in the business. We were busier than we've ever been in the whole 10 years. It was the busiest six months, people kept coming back, and just everything has changed for the, for the better. So uh, I'm glad I came home finally. I have had a revelation. God, I wish I could live long enough to see it through. People have to grow together. They have to do physical, mental, psychological, spiritual processes together. And as they deepen and hold each other's dreams, by God they go out and make a difference. We need to grow together and deepen the dialogue. We have to get to the place deeper than the agenda. We need to find the common ground where the fundamental Christians and the gay community can talk together. Where the loggers and the environmentalists can learn to respect and protect the environment together. The agenda is the smokescreen for the deeper issues of transformation that are going on. And at a very deep level, we are all in the same boat together. Margaret Mead For me, cob building, which is a, basically an earthing construction, um, it's uh, one of my passions more than anything is building that way because it allows for, more than anything, people to come together. It takes so many hands to dive in and create that space. Um, a lot of time and effort of the people and very little money in the materials. Um, and it allows for, in the process of this building being created, people's dreams unfold as they grab a chunk of clay and they start working it into that building. They're 
their energy is directly infused in every step al along the process of creating that space. So that, more than anything, has been my passion and role here. And I guess each of us have our passions and our roles that bring us together and helping us, um, we're each here to help each other um, express those roles. And, um, and then hopefully together we unfold into something that is um, a greater dream than each, each one of us in individually could see. The building of the sanctuary with a friend Tarla was uh, quite an extraordinary experience for me. And um, it, um, I was formerly involved with health education in Vancouver. And when I came to um, Xenia, I, I became very immersed in carpentry. And during that process of building, I realized that there was uh, kind of a gradual transformation taking place in me. And that was that I was falling in love with wood all over again. And uh, some of the wood that we find here on Xenia is particularly appealing. And I happen to be very fond of cedar, not only the smell, but working with cedar. And there's a lot of cedar in the sanctuary. The front of the building of the sanctuary is... Um, has a quite a, um, a, um, a thick door that um, I created. And, and, and another shift took place for me as I was um, creating that door. And that was that I had to step back so many times because I just didn't know what I should do and I didn't know exactly what form it should take. And I kept stepping back, going inside, and just asking for guidance and waiting. And in that process of stepping back so many times, I realized that there was a, a transformation of another kind going on. And that was I was finding my own inner sanctuary. And I was pausing. I was learning how to pause to find that. And that now has become my spiritual practice. I call it pausing. And it's not just the only spiritual practice I do, but it's one I do frequently and I find very valuable. Uh, the reason I came to Xenia is because I'm working to on, on the culmination of a 15-year project to produce a new way for uh, to help people to change attitude at a very fundamental level. We call it instinctive learning, and uh, I've been researching this since 1989, how to help people to change their uh, their ways that they get in their own way. Um, um, prevent themselves from being as effective as they want to be. So I've come up with an, a new way to help people to do that, and it's now time to turn that into a classroom technique. Currently, it's just one-on-one -on -one coaching. So uh, I'm here to uh, rewrite the manuals to produce a CD-ROM and uh, an online classroom concept, and uh, one of my clients suggested that uh, Xenia would be the place to do it, a brilliant retreat and far from the madding crowd. And uh, so that's what I'm working on. Uh, since I've come here, I've, uh, uh, it's, it's everything that uh, I was told it would be. It's absolutely a brilliant place to do creative work. And, um, and also I've started to integrate some of the things I'm doing into the programs that they have here. So we'll be doing some collaboration, producing workshops for people, that kind of stuff. Uh, and um, I don't know what to, what more to say about Xenia. It's just the uh, it's probably the most relaxing, the 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 best place I've ever been to get into that joy of creation, where you can just 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 create what you uh, what you're here to do for you know what what you're here for, and um, yeah, I think it'll be quite difficult to pry me loose from the place. So I'm not sure what's going to happen later. My own personal experience over the years has been really powerful. Like I know for myself, in the 10 years that Xenia has been here, I am a totally, I would say, changed person. I was very shy, very introverted, didn't especially like people. What a perfect place to come to, a retreat center. What the heck? When people started arriving, I was actually shocked when they wanted to know my story. And it, I started telling people my story about how I got here and all the different ingredients that were involved. 
and it had an impact on me. Somehow, the connection with the people, kind of like, like a rock being made smooth, my sharp edges started dropping off. I used to have a little habit of kind of like really cutting people off short or, and now I'm willing to listen. I do listen. I'm interested. They're interested in what I have to say. It's, um, it's quite something to have seen and been the transformation. What I love about working at Xenia so much is the healing energy that's here. It's like, I see Xenia as a golden place that, that spreads gold out into the world. And people that come here, they seem to be ready to shift something in their lives or heal something at a very deep level. Uh, every single person that ends up on my massage table experiences fantastic shifts while we're here. And what I credit this to is, is the energy of Xenia. You know, I just get out of the way and Xenia works through me and has her way with people. You know, it's just amazing, amazing the shifts that I see here. Uh, working with Angelina in her programs is fantastic as well. Um, finding grace in everything, helping people to find grace is uh, what she does is she gets them ready for the table and vice versa, I guess. But she seems to get them ready for the table and when, when they're on the table, they just let it go, whatever it is. I, I help them move it through their body. And I find that the problems that people end up with are just, they just need grace to shift them. And once the person finds the grace, they're free and they're, they're free to go and be who they are and, and live their lives. It's just quite beautiful and magical. Horses are very, very dear to me, and I love them. And it's so wonderful that here we have these two horses, Tango and Sandman. Tango's a thoroughbred, 16-1, and Sandy's, um, he's Anglo-Arab, and he's around 15-2. Now, having these horses be free here at Xenia on 38 acres plus, some people would consider a crazy, crazy thing to do because they should be contained in paddocks and such like. Well, I would have agreed with this before, but I started to let them free um, probably a week after they arrived here. And they love it, and the guests love it. And there are so, so many stories of, of the magic that happens and the healing that happens because these horses are able to wander through. There was this one guest, she was staying up at Maple Cottage, and she was terrified of horses. I believe she was from Japan, just terrified. So she was hoping that she wouldn't come upon these horses. On the last day, day number three, and I don't know how she avoided them till then, but she was walking along the, ro the, um, the labyrinth roadway. She opened the gate and she was walking along and she saw the two horses on the road and they were both head to butt, sleeping. They were kind of sleeping kind of turned opposite to each other so she thought she would just kind of she said okay this is a moment of I can either grow and do this or I can retreat and not grow but she decided she was going to take a leap of faith so she started walking kind of a wide berth of the horses making her way to the labyrinth as soon as she got by the horses Tango's head came up and he looked over at her and he immediately proceeded to follow up behind her and nudged her under the armpit. And she was like, oh my God, oh my God. So she made her way to the labyrinth and she said, okay, they won't come in the labyrinth, that'll be great. But sure enough, Tango clip clops across the walls of the labyrinth and meets her in the center. So she's standing in the center and she's like, and suddenly she became calm. And she had this very profound moment with this horse and Pretty soon she came out of there and she asked one of the people down at the lodge if they would hold the horse while she could groom them in the afternoon. Now that healing, I know, goes beyond her fear of horses. There must be other fears in her life that got transcended in that moment with Tango. And there are so many stories, you know, there's this young girl that was here and she was crying her eyes out and upset because she'd broken something. And Tango goes up and he's puts his head in the window and he stands there and he will not leave her for about half an hour while she's crying. 
and again she was totally affected by the love of this animal. Now these animals, they come up to my house for carrots during the afternoon or now that we have Charlie the pig, he comes up for raisins. But the idea that they're all kind of free and moving around is, is a wonderful experience for most people. Even the ones that are afraid, they have to admit before, before they leave that, wow, this is, this is something very, very magical and unusual for them. I'm Kasara Angeline's daughter, and this is my horse, Tango. We both live at Xenia. I'm a longer resident than he is, but um, he came to us during a rough time, and he's been a great friend for me through it all. Um, living here has definitely been a huge advantage in my life, and it's been a great thing for me growing up in nature and on a beautiful island, yet close to the city. Um, we spend a lot of time out here on the trails, riding. We have our own riding ring just up by the labyrinth. And um, Tango enjoys meeting a lot of the guests. Um, lots of people enjoy his company and he reacts in a million different ways. We could probably write a book about all of different people's encounters with Tango. He seems to pick out if you're afraid of him or if you like him and he's very, very friendly. Um, I do the catering often, or I've just started, and I really enjoy that because of the fact that I get to really interact with the people that come here. There's people from all over the world, and I really enjoy hearing the stories and hearing different people's view of, of what they find at Xenia. Uh, that's the other horse, Sandman. He, he wanted to get a word in, too. Both of them roam free around here. There's no fences or anything. They sleep in a barn at night and they love it here, as do I. Several years into the project, we came upon some real financial struggles and these financial struggles seemed to escalate and before we knew it, we were, we were really in trouble. Personally, I was in trouble. And I, um, what happened was every single thing that I had in terms of investments and um, dried up completely and people were not coming to Xenia and I had a very very large investment that went uh, we could say south it was a it became a fraudulent thing we were having um, hydro disconnection notices BC tell disconnection notices well it was BC tell then it's tell us now but um, it was extremely scary time and for about two years I was in a place of, of fear, fear constantly, trying to juggle and, and find help and explain to people. I think I really wore people out in the end, you know, here she is again with her problems, but I truly could not see this project that we were in the process of, of developing, just see it go back to the banks. And that's what looked very, very much like it was going to happen. During that two years, at the very end of about two years, there was a three-month period where I would say, I would call it sustained terror. <laughs> I woke up in the morning and I was in terror. And I went to bed at night and I was in terror. You know, it was like I was just living on this edge. And we were five months behind in the mortgage and it was so, so scary. And of course, the fear, the terror was beyond even the financial. It, it was something that had triggered me at a deep core level. I will put my daughter on the school bus and come home and just cry. So this one day, I just said, okay, that's it. I am done. It's over. I walked into my living room. I sat down on the couch. And I just let this terror have me. It was just like I could feel this, these, these waves of, of, of like fire from the bottom of my body moving up through my whole entire being. And it was as if I was being consumed by this fire as I let terror have me. I literally gave, it, gave myself to the terror. And in that process, I don't know how long it was, but the next thing I noticed was I became very, very still, very quiet. And I noticed, oh, the terror had moved aside. And there wasn't very much going on, you know, there wasn't any story or fear or internal dialogue. 
And over the next couple of days, a girlfriend and I got on the phone and we raised three and a half, in, in three and a half hours, we raised um, $20,000 of gifted money. And with that, we were able to put the mortgage back on track. And from there, really, it has been one miracle after another until the position now where we're really moving ahead with the business and also receiving donations. And it's, it's, um, but that moment, that willingness to, to really give my full attention to the terror was again another pivotal moment in time because really since then and it's been about four years I have never experienced terror or fear again and I'm not saying it wouldn't arise if it does I'll give it my attention and um, so I learned such a valuable lesson of not resisting these these feelings and these things that arise but instead to embrace to give it my full and complete attention it was me it wanted so this was, was very, very powerful. What I've learned many years since that experience is it really the grace from that. You know, I could look back and think I made a really bad financial decision around some of the investments, and I certainly did. But that obviously what was supposed to happen, because it did happen. And out of that, when I look back and I think I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy, I would not wish those two years. And my daughter and I, we, we always share that, that particular time in our lives. But as a result, talk about finding grace in everything. There has been such valuable, valuable gifts found from that experience. And now I'm grateful that I went through that dark night of the soul was very, very important in my life. So if anybody ever feels that, they, that they're in some kind of a descent or things are very difficult, I say, great, bring it on. Give it your attention. That's the way to go. As I move along in this journey, I notice things just become easier and easier. And the more simple I allow things to be, the more graceful they become, really and truly. Everything is simple. And if I give, just keep showing up, basically, show up in this moment, then everything that I need seems to be provided, just like Carol Fernie said way back when. Some of the great um, teachers that have come here, Eckhart Tolle came and spent the day with me here one, um, one uh, winter, actually. It was a very wonderful experience. And again, his teaching of the power of now, being here now. Don't miss your life. You know, we, we miss our lives because we're in the past, we're in the future, and we're not here where the gift is. So from the ashes, really, Xenia has been created over 10 years into a beautiful, pristine sanctuary of nature and stillness, creativity. People can come and really enjoy themselves in nature. And I'm grateful for this journey of radical trust where beautiful people come from around the world and wonderful cross-cultural leaders. We've had the pleasure of having Venerable Lactor here and also Dorothy McLean from Findhorn, one of the three founders and a special experience of Black Elk, a native elder from the States, here on September the 11th, 2001. It's been an extraordinary journey of radical trust and willingness. And what I love the most about it, really and truly, is the great mystery and never really knowing what's next. And I'm at peace with this now. of the soul
journey through the unknown Embrace the silence 